Welcome to Health Bites. Thank you everyone for joining us. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers, Katie Leaf and Jen Gann. Jen is a research instructor and manager in the Center for Health Literacy, Department of Medical Humanities and Bioethics at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, or UAMS. Her research interests include health disparities with a focus on health literacy, ethnicity, and gender. She is a facilitator for CHL field testing of health education materials, interprofessional education, implicit bias training, and the UAMS Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity Program. Katie is the program manager for services and communication at the Center for Health at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. In this position, she lends her health communication expertise to help create and edit health-related materials for patients and consumers at UAMS and beyond. Before joining the center, Katie worked in health policy research and evaluation. In today's Health Bites, Jen and Katie will give a presentation on incorporating health literacy and community engagement. Thank you, Jen and Katie, for being our guest speakers this morning, and I will turn everything over to you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so we're gonna be talking about incorporating health literacy in community engagement. So thank you for the introductions. And today we're gonna to be talking about um, our University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences Center for Health Literacy's patient and community engagement tools. So we'll also be sharing how you can use these tools in your communities and review our approach for developing these tools. So to, we've developed resources to help people improve their health literacy skills and to better care for themselves. So these tools are available in print um, or online as a digital module. So when you share these resources with your patients um, and community members, you're empowering them to communicate more effectively with you and to better engage in self-care. So today we're just gonna focus on a few of our mo more popular titles. And you can learn more and see samples of these materials on the website, which is healthliteracy.uams.edu. And there's a link in the chat box. So this is one of our first resources that our center had developed. It was funded by the USDA, which is the Department of Agriculture. And it was in partnership with the University of Arkansas Cooperative Extension Services. So this How to Talk to Your Doctor handbook reviews five easy steps and it uses your hand as a mnemonic tool in order to prepare you to talk with your doctor. So the first step is to remember. So this one, you either picture uh, tying a ribbon around your finger or you can point to your head. So this is to remember to bring items like your insurance card, your photo ID um, to your visit and things that you might need to either see hear or talk to your doctor. So the second step is to practice um, your two minute history. So this booklet kind of gives prompts um, as to things like uh, when my recent problem started. And this allows patients to prepare the details that the doctor might need. Um, and for the third step, we use the three fingers. So this is a W, it looks like the letter W and it stands for words. And this is to remind you to repeat back the instructions um, of what you hear in your own words. So step four. So this one is to remind you um, for, uh, to, about the important information um, like forms that you will need to fill out at your doctor's office. So there are sections in the booklet to write things down um, such as dates of surgeries, uh, family history, or maybe some contact information um, from your other doctors, things that you might not know off the top of your head. And the fifth step is an open hand with your palm up. And this is to remind you to take your medicine. So this has two meanings. So that means to, that you can take your medicine as prescribed and to also to take all your medicine bottles with you when you go to your doctor's appointment. And this includes things like, you know, vitamins and over-the-counter um, medication. And this has a, and our booklet has a space for you to add your medication list. So the Spanish adaptation of this booklet did win the Clearmark Award of Distinction and the overall Spanish Category Grand Award 
from the National Center for Plain Language. We have continued to host sessions using this material with organizations such as the Adult Learning Alliance and AmeriCorps Volunteers. And Katie has given presentation for kids aging out of foster care and other youth in crisis through Immerse Arkansas. We really are excited about updating this material and um, developing a new online module and are planning to integrate this um, framework into our medical institution's electronic health records. So the next booklet um, was How to Talk to Your Child's Doctor. So this one was designed as part of a foundation grant from a petroleum company, and this was to improve parents' communication with their child's primary care doctor. So the handbook teaches parents four steps to prepare for and to get the most out of their visit, and this uses the acronym STAR. So it, S stands for schedule the right appointment. This is to help people, um, gives them some tips and the differences between a well child visit um, versus a sick visit. T is for take all of your important items and information with you. A is a reminder to ask all of your questions during your appointment. And it also has a space for you to write down any questions that you would have ahead of time so that you don't forget. And R is to repeat back the instructions in your own words. So having the patient repeat back what they understood in their own words is called you know, the teach back method, um, which is a health literacy best practice tool. And we won't have time, unfortunately, to go into this today. Um, but this handbook does have, um, is also available in Spanish and the Spanish adaptation, Como Hablar con el Doctor de Su Niño, teaches parents five easy steps using the acronym HONOR. So our Spanish program administrator was a native Spanish speaker and trained in plain language best practices. And she really needed to be creative in culturally adapting some of these materials in order to keep the steps simple and the meaning of the content as well as that acronym to be similar to the English version. So our this project was funded by the network of the national Library of Medicine, which is NNLM. Thank you for hosting today's event. Um, so, and having um, a background in mental health for myself, I was really excited to be a part of this project. Um, it really came about because community members and faith leaders identified the need for emotional wellness tools to help both teens and adults learn how to maintain or improve their emotional wellness. Um, during this project, I participated in two group sessions, focus group sessions for the English version. One was in central Arkansas and the other one was in the Delta region of the state. So, and this is where the prevalence of low health literacy and poor mental health are the highest. And during each session, we came back with valuable feedback and great suggestions to improve the guide. And Katie will be describing our field testing process a little bit more in detail later. So this how to move toward emotional wellness booklet covers changes that may signal that your emotional wellness needs attention, things that you can do to improve your emotional wellness or to keep it at the level where it is, um, tips on what you might say to someone else to encourage them to pay attention to their emotional wellness. And this was something that was added um, as a, a suggestion from community members. They really wanted to know how to help others um, that may need some additional assistance. And it also covers how to get help from a professional. So it talks about who to contact and what to expect during those visits. And because of funding from NNLM, copies of this guide are available to any organization in Arkansas at no cost. And then these guides, uh, this guide uses the acronym MOVE um, to help readers remember what they've learned. So the M stands for mark any changes you have in behavior so the purpose is really to identify any possible concerns or changes. Um, o is for own your emotional wellness. B is visit a professional to get more support. And this kind of, like I said before, reviews those different types of professionals and includes ways to find someone who can help. And E is to expect that this will take time and keep, and it's something to continue to work at. So our Spanish adaptation, como dar un paso and ASIA El Bienestar Emocional uses the acronym PASO, which means step. And this kind of uses the same framework to teach these lessons. 
And with additional funding from NNLM, the Spanish adaptation was distributed across three states, which was Arkansas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. And it was really one of the first Spanish field testing sessions I attended. And although I'm not a fluent Spanish speaker, um, my mom is from Mexico and I've been very passionate about promoting our Spanish language tools. And kind of to keep us moving in that right direction, the NNLM had funded the adaptation of these emotional wellness booklets into an online um, digital module. And this was really so that we could reach a large audience, um, which really became critical during the current pandemic when we were no longer able to host in-person sessions. And these are freely available on patientslearn.uams.edu. Um, um, patients and you can also find it on um, our website, which is in the chat. So for these online digital models modules, we did follow the same iterative and multi-editor process to develop scripts as, and did field testing of the digital module with com uh, community members. And this was over a digital platform. And our, this one is our newest module. So I think we've all had some increased stress anxiety and a little sadness over the past couple of years. And the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly impacted emotional wellness across the United States. So recognizing, recognizing this increased need, NNLM funded the newest digital module in our suite of emotional wellness tools. And this one's called How to Lift Your Spirits During COVID and uh, um, COVID-19 and Other Hard Times. Uh, this interactive module really helps adults and teens recognize the ways that the current pandemic might be impacting their emotional wellness, and it does offer some practical tips to address those challenges. And in this digital module, we increased the number of interactive teaching activities. We incorporated more conversation starters and examples, and then added some resources, not only for the person who's taking it, but also um, if they have children or other resources. Um, and this module uses the acronym LIFT to discuss um, these steps. So L is for limit your COVID-19 information. So this talks about limiting the amount of time you spend reading news, as well as limiting where you get your information from. So and that's from only a few trusted sources. And we also go over how to identify what those trusted sources are. I is for interact, so is interacting with friends um, and family in a safe and positive way. Uh, social engagement is important, and we give tips on how to do this safely, as well as some conversation starters for how to disagree with respect for those difficult conversations. F is for focus on what you can control, and on, it also demonstrates some positive thinking for those things that you can't control. And then T is to take time to, um, to work on your emotional wellness every day. So this really has some suggestions for things that we all can do um, right now and to expect that these changes do take some time. So these materials really are meant to be used in, with either patients in a clinical setting or with community members. You can host the sessions one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting and for all of our booklets and digital modules, we do have facilitators guides available. These, these guides are designed to make it easy for you to walk the participant through the material. Um, and I've found these facilitators guides very helpful when I'm um, hosting a session. So, and they include things like, um, some of them have information about health literacy, um, suggestions for recruitment and room setup, scripts that incorporate teach back prompts so that the per participant can use their own words to explain what they understand. And this does allow you to clarify if needed and helps to confirm understanding. It also has some talking points and resources for you to share with your community members and some evaluation forms and questions so that you can get feedback. And again, you can see samples um, and access the materials on our web website, which is located in the chat. And now I'm going to hand it over to Katie, who's going to walk you through our process for developing some of these new materials. Thank you, Jen. 
So our team at the Center for Health Literacy uses a well-established iterative process to develop these new materials. So next, I'm going to talk about the development process, which includes input from subject matter experts, team-based plain language writing and editing, and a published method for field testing with individuals with known risks for inadequate health literacy. This is an, an illustration of our um, design process. Uh, to get started, um, if you look in that develop content circle there in the top left, plain language writers and subject matter experts convene to establish consensus on content elements. Key messages for new materials are framed using health behavior theory. Sometimes um, we have to engage in further background research to um, figure out what the literature says about certain um, health problems and talking points. And we also um, a lot of times engage community members, members in formative group discussions um, to better understand what the target audience's needs are and refine the content. This um, informs the development of a final outline for the new material, and then a lead writer gets started on drafting the content using all of their plain language best practices, um, and then it's informed further by health behavior theory. And one of our favorite theories is using the health belief model, and we use it to address possible perceptions regarding susceptibility, severity, benefits, and barriers to uptake certain health services. Um, after an initial draft, the material will go through a review process with other plain language writers and includes in a formal assessment for readability and um, plain language attributes. Then subject matter experts give approval before we move to this next step. But before we dig into the process um, here, anymore. Let's talk about some of the basic plain language principles our writing team uses to make information readable, understandable, and actionable. Let's get on the same page about plain language first. Um, it's information that people understand the first time they see it or hear it. It is readable. We typically aim for our written materials to be below seventh grade, so it falls into the easy to read category as defined by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. But plain language is more than just a grade level. Plain language is also understandable. You can have something that's easy to read, but it may not be written in a way that makes sense to anyone. For example, using idioms colloquialisms and certain slang may not hold the same meaning for um, different cultural groups, and therefore your message could be lost. Um, plain language is also actionable. It tells people what to do, how to do it, when to do it, where to go to do it. Um, for example, I could give you directions to my house, but if I'm missing a step or I tell you to turn left instead of right, then you probably aren't going to get there. Here's something that plain language is not, though. It is not dumbing down. Think instead about it as communicating clearly with your audience. This chart here demonstrates why plain language is important. It's not uncommon for people to struggle with health information approximately 35 out of 100 American adults in the blue and red have either basic or below basic health literacy skills. This is over seven, 75 million adults in the US. This group of people have trouble um, using graphs and charts to determine a healthy weight based on their height. They cannot read a prescription label and determine the correct amount of medicine to take and they cannot read a one-page fact sheet about a health problem and use that information they read to answer some basic questions. In the U.S., only about 12 out of 100 adults, the, the ones that you see in the green at the top, have proficient health literacy. But even though for those who have adequate health literacy, please remember that everyone benefits from clear communication. 
This is because context, like being stressed, can influence your ability to concentrate and take on information. And I can use myself as an example. Um, I would consider myself to have pretty adequate health literacy um, beyond that basic and below basic category. But if I'm stressed because I have taken my kid to the hospital or when he was in the NICU as a baby, some things were hard for me to really um, understand. And, and so any, everyone uh, benefits from the clear communication. So what do we do about, about this? How do we make our communication more clear? Well, first we you know, aim to make materials readable. Like we said before, we aim for a grade level below seventh grade, making them easy to read. The main tricks to making materials more readable are shorter words and shorter sentences. Shorter words are those with two syllables or less and shorter sentences are 20 words or less. On this slide, there's some examples of alternatives to some common healthcare terms. Um, so instead of saying healthcare provider, we tend to use the word doctor. Instead of pediatrician, that has a lot of syllables, we use child's doctor. Um, medication, again, a lot of syllables. Um, people really prefer the term medicine. Um, not, we've used med before, but um, we've learned from our focus group participants that that seems more like slang. And when people read the word drug instead of medication, they think of more of like an illegal drug, not a medicine that you take because you were prescribed by your doctor. And then instead of saying immunization, you could say vaccine or shot. And then on the example on the right in this slide, we have a long sentence, it's 35 words. It's, um, so before you go see your healthcare provider, write down your questions so you know what to ask. And as your doctor answers the questions, take notes about what they tell you. There are a lot of ideas in that sentence to take in and dissect and could be really overwhelming for somebody that is either stressed or has struggle reading um, and could overburden them. So instead we may split this sentence up into two short sentences like the example here. Write down your questions before your doctor's visit. Be sure to take notes about your doctor's answers. So the first sentence is only eight words and the second sentence is only nine words. And while I didn't run um, a readability assessment on this, I can promise you that those are gonna come in a lot lower than, um, than the original long sentence. So there's many things that we can do to promote understanding in our materials. And those include word choice, sentence structure, headings, and how you deal with numbers. And there's a lot of overlap here in um, making materials readable and understandable. Word, cho word choice relates to using more common words and avoiding jargon. And like I described in the previous slide, that helps with readability too. Um, with the short, some of those shorter words on the previous slide, some of you may have thought now, Katie, some of these alternatives are actually adding words. And to that, I'd say you're right. It would make the sentence a little longer. But when you write, um, we don't only consider having shorter words and shorter sentences, but we also think about what is more commonly used or how people talk in their living room. Um, you likely don't say, hey, granny. How was your appointment with your healthcare provider? You don't say that. You say, how did your doctor's visit go? Keep it short. You take out the jargon. Um, and although we want to acknowledge that not all providers are doctors, sometimes, of course, there are physician's assistants and APRNs. Um, we have learned from our focus groups that the general public doesn't really care too much about this distinction and that term healthcare provider really throws them off. They're not quite sure what you mean by that. Word choice also relates to using consistent terminology, avoiding metaphors and colloquialisms like I talked about before and um, avoiding acronyms unless they're really familiar like saying US, probably most people understand that, that stands in the right context for the United States. 
Sentence structure includes breaking up sentences to make them shorter, like I discussed before. Um, that also helps with readabil readability, but also using bullets for lists, and I'm going to show you an example in a minute, and using the serial or Oxford comma that can help break up sentences and provide clarity. Um, and if you aren't familiar with the serial or Oxford comma, that's when you have a comma before the and and the or in a list of three or more items. Um, so regarding headings, headings can help help people navigate the material and easy, easily find what they need without having to weed through all the information we tend to use. Um, a question and answer heading the most, but sometimes that doesn't really work. As long as the headings are consistent, so if you're going to use a question and answer heading, then use it throughout, and that the heading can stand alone, like it, you know exactly what to expect from the, from the information underneath the heading. For example, a heading hypertension leads me to ask, well, what about hypertension? So depending on the content and the purpose, maybe a more appropriate heading is what is hypertension. And then lastly, um, something you can work on to promote understanding in your written materials are um, to simplify numbers. And I could talk for probably a whole hour just on numbers alone, um, but in short, people are more likely to struggle with numbers than words really. There's a similar graph we have to the, um, that's also from the National Assessment of Adult Liter Literacy on um, people that have basic, below basic, intermediate, and proficient health numeracy skills. And it looks quite a bit different. Um, and if you think about it, um, it's not really surprising. I mean, how many of you say, I love math? I'm going to guess it's probably not very many. Um, I do love math, by the way, but um, I know that I'm a weirdo in that. So before you add numbers to health information, think about if it's really necessary, if, if it really makes a difference in helping a reader understand or act. And then if it is, make sure to always use a numeral and not spell out TWO for the, the number two, just use that number two. And instead of using percentages, use whole numbers to demonstrate risk. For example, instead of saying 33%, um, you could use one out of three. And using icon arrays along with avoiding percentages can go a long way in making numbers a bit easier for people to understand. And here's this example that I promised you um, of headings and lists from one of the spreads of the move booklet, um, how to move toward emotional wellness that Jen talked about earlier. You can see here that there are consistent question headings on the page. This helps the reader find what they're looking for. They're bolded and purple, so um, you, they stand out. And the headings also completely describe what information is under that heading, and this helps the reader know what to expect. This helps them um, easily scan, like, I know where I can go maybe to find a professional, but I don't know what I should do when I get there. So I can go to that, what should I do during my emotional wellness visit and find the information that I'm, I'm looking for. The last plain language tip I'm gonna leave you with is to make your writing actionable. Um, this includes, of course, using active voice and giving the reader all the information, the who, what, when, where, and how, um, like we said before, that they need to act. But another thing you can do is that we do is to incorporate um, using tools to help the reader act. Tools include activity logs, tables and charts to list medicine, food journals, um, symptom diaries, and so on. On this slide, um, you can see a tool we created for our How to Talk to Your Child's Doctor Handbook. Um, to help parents collect the right information to take with them to their child's doctor's appointment. Um, if you can see, you see at the top of the page, there's a heading. It says, write down the information to take with you. Um, we have a form there underneath with some specifics for them to fill out based on if they're going to a well or sick visit. This was developed based on formative conversations we had with pediatricians about what could make visits with patients better. 
and they unanimously said that people just come unprepared for for the visit and and sometimes don't know what kinds of things they should share during um, a visit and helping them organize these thoughts uh, in this uh, form is helpful. So then we, you know, put, put to use this easy to use form with instructions for the parent to fill out. Now you could just always, you know, the doctor could always tell them to keep a symptom journal when they're sick, but that may not give that doctor all the information that they need. This form um, gives them specific things to record to help the doctor make the right treatment choices. And it gives the reader all the information that they need to act. And quite honestly, if someone tells me to create my own log, that's just one more step. It's one more thing I have to do and I'm less likely to do it. So that tool really helps them take action and, and actually do what you're asking them to do. So um, back to this iterative design process. Um, so now that we've covered some of the basic plain language writing principles next in our process is to field test. Um, after we think we have all the plain language stuff down, it's right, the best, the best that it is. Um, and the content is approved by subject matter experts, we convene a group of community members to test the material. Sometimes this is undesigned content, just, you know, words on a page. And sometimes it's a fully designed prototype. This depends on where we are in the development process. And, and it also depends on what we're testing. And um, But this part in our process probably makes the most improvements in our work. Field testing contributes to user-centered design and ensures health materials are vetted by those who will eventually use them. When materials are field tested, the resulting product is much more likely to be understandable and usable for the reader. Um, through a focus group process, we engage patients, consumers, and community representatives in an interactive session to verify that materials are well understood and usable. We work with subject matter experts and our clients to craft discussion guides that meet their needs and get the right information from our participants. Our field testing sessions include individuals who are at risk for inadequate health literacy as determined by a validated health literacy screener. We use um, the NVS um, or the newest vinyl sign as our main health literacy screening tool um, to, and we use it to screen the community members that come to our um, focus groups. Um, using the NVS, if you're not familiar, um, you give the participant a copy of a nutrition label from a container of ice cream and then you ask them a series of questions. It's, um, it's six or seven questions depending on if they get there's some of them that you skip if they don't get another one right. And this gives us a score to determine if they are at risk for um, inadequate health literacy. We also use another tool, another validated screener for health literacy um, that is used in our medical center. It's a single um, screening question. The question is, how confident are you filling out medical forms by yourself? And this screener was validated against the um, NVS. And for, we use this, um, like I said, in our medical center and for certain projects, we can recruit our patients who have been screened using this method. Since those um, with um, inadequate health literacy may also not be comfortable speaking out in a group setting when they don't know anybody else, we have a published method that supports those who may not be comfortable giving us this feedback. We, um, it's called um, stoplight coding, and you can see the stoplight on the slide here. We ask participants to mark up or color code different parts of the material in red, yellow, and green based on if it's hard, could be better, or it's easy. Some other things we do to um, make these participants more comfortable is we establish ground rules in the beginning of the session. Um, 
you know, we spend time trying to get to know these people and develop relationships with them. And it just makes them more comfortable and willing to share. It's, it's kind of fun um, to watch. Um, also in our field testing sessions, we have a trained facilitator and note taker. The facilitator uses a written guide to lead to discussion and gain consensus on items that are hard or could be better and discuss other important items that were um, about either process of delivery or um, what the document looks like. And then the note taker not only takes notes, but serves as just an extra set of ears to help in consensus building. Um, after the focus group, we give each of our participants a gift card. The amount can vary, but it's at least $30 for an hour and a half session. And prior to COVID, we were conducting these sessions with eight to 10 people in person, but we have modified this process for virtual discussions using Zoom to keep our staff and participants safe during the pandemic. You may be thinking that engaging those who are likely to have trouble understanding health information in a virtual setting could pose its challenges, and I'll let you know that you're right there. But one of the features that we've added to our focus groups in planning them is to do tech checks with all of the participants prior to the group discussion. These take like 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, if they're a new participant, maybe a little bit longer. And during this time, we just make sure that these participants can access Zoom, that they can use their camera and mic and turn it off and on and use other features on the platform. And we just spend time individually helping them get comfortable. Um, last thing about um, the field testing, we've also developed specific methods for testing those digital materials that Jen um, told you about earlier. We typically start with a content only review in the focus group. Normally the participants are just reviewing a plain word document with text to help us find the concepts and ideas that could be expressed more clearly. They also give us ideas on what we can do in the design phase on how to make it just more appealing um, to the audience. And after a um, a designed prototype is ready, we do some one-on-one -on -one testing. This allows us to see how people use digital materials to work and it helps us work out any bugs and helps us see how long it takes. And we do this also on Zoom. We just kind of watch them go through the module and help them get through any parts that they are really stuck on um, and, and talk to them about what they liked and didn't like and what could be better. Um, then we follow that up with some small group sessions for feedback, and so the participants review the module or digital material in advance and give us um, feedback. We have a discussion guide um, for that specifically. Katie, I'm going to um, just jump in. There's a, a question which is kind of relevant to what we're talking about here, and I think you have a good answer for it, but so um, Calvin was asking, with the stoplight coding idea, have you run into any difficulties with colorblind patients? And if so, how do you work around those? We have not, um, and that's interesting. That's not, um, I've not thought of that before. I did have a boss at once that was colorblind and it was kind of funny. He'd always make sure that he was matching and stuff, but we have not run into that. Um, I will say that um, since we can't be in person with our participants right now, um, we don't use the color coding exactly like it was intended and designed originally. Instead, we have people, um, I think they put a circle or a box around the stuff that's hard and they underline the stuff that could be better. So that could be a, a method for helping those that um, can't can't see the different colors and are colorblind. Good question. Yeah, and if we did have something like that um, in one of our sessions, you know, most common is the red green colorblind. And so if we were there facilitating in person, we would be able to help them with the different colors. Um, so it's not necessarily, you know, the, the colors that matter, um, but it's a great question just to help us identify the different ones. Thank you.
So back to the iterative design process, on to this next step. After we've, um, we've had one field testing session, um, we suggest or make the changes um, based on the items participants reach consensus on. We typically don't make changes on things just because of one uh, participant's suggestion. We instead, our facilitators work to get consensus on what works for everyone. Um, we also allow our subject matter experts to weigh in on these changes. So um, we, so that at that point we edit that prototype um, and then produce a new one and can retest. And those next steps can really vary by project on how many times we go through the edit and retesting. We find that we get the best product if we test the material at least two times, but sometimes um, when you do content before it's laid out and then you test the, um, the actual design prototype a few times, more can be um, necessary. But the bottom line is when the process is complete, the result is a material that's easy for people to read and understand and use, which is our goal. So I think we have um, some time for questions. Um, and thank you for that first question. Yes, well, th yes. thank you for a wonderful presentation. And so, yes, we'd like to open it up uh, to any questions. So write those in the chat. And actually, I will, I will start with the, the first question while everyone's busy typing. From the time you first create the original content to the time you finish all of the, the field test, what is the typical time frame, or is mm -hmm. there a typical time frame? No, <laughs> it can really vary. It depends on, I think, how new when we've when we've written about the same thing, you know, several times. Like we've done a lot of stuff on safe sleep. Like have numerous clients um, and done a lot of work on safe sleep. So we're pretty familiar with that content. We know what the sticking points are. Um, so sometimes we don't test that as frequently. It also depends on, we do all of this work. Um, you know, Jen shared those um, documents. They have um, Spanish companions. And so we do all of this work in English and Spanish. And so a lot of times we field test with um, Spanish speaking individuals as well. So it just three months at least, and sometimes long, and sometimes even a lot longer a year. Thank you. Okay, the questions are starting to come in. From Lindsay, we have where and how do you recruit your focus group participants? Jen, do you want to take that one? All right. Um, so yes. So question was where and how do we recruit our focus group participants? So we do have um, a database of volunteers. Um, it's over 600 people, um, both English and, and Spanish. And these are really community members. Um, and some of them um, we know, as, as Katie mentioned before, we do some health literacy screening um, just to kind of get an idea of what the mix of the crowd is. And so um, we'll do that before they attend the focus group session. So um, really the people that are in our volunteer database are community members. And we are currently working on expanding that network um, to more the rural regions of our state, um, as well as just increasing kind of the, the awareness of it. And we have people who really enjoy um, participating and being able to give their feedback on these materials. Um, so it's been really great to participate. Um, like I said, field testing is one of my favorite things to do. So I really appreciate that. Great question. Okay, and we have a, another question from Diane asking if you can talk about licensing and cost. Um, I can a little bit, but it kind of depends on, um, you know, the prod, like what particular item you want um, to use and why you're using it. And um, if we already have um, copies printed or, and if we've had, we've had people ask to co-brand the material with us too. And so we have to go through some design work um, to do that. Um, so it kind of, it 
there's a lot of factors that depend on that. If that's something that you're interested in doing, um, please reach out. You can reach us at our generic um, email address, which is healthliteracy at uams.edu. You can see there um, ways to stay connected with us. Good question. Okay, so we have any other questions coming in? Kind of thinking more about Lindsay's question and you know, I wasn't sure if I answered it adequately, but really um, this database has grown tremendously over the past um, probably three or four years. And a lot of it, um, the volunteers that we get are from, you know, attending things like health fairs and then several different institutions that, you know, um, volunteer at. So one of the places I volunteer is a free clinic that serves the Spanish speaking population. And so we do have some flyers and it's just letting people know that um, they can give us feedback on these health materials and that we do pay for their time. And what we do is have um, uh, in, within our database, in order to make it you know, kind of fair and randomized, we do put the list of participants through a, um, a randomization um, algorithm in order to kind of choose who's gonna be there. And then, like I said before, when they show up, if they haven't participated in one before, will administer that health literacy screener. And so we do try to um, have, you know, approximately at least half of the group um, with people who struggle with health literacy to make sure that it's easy for everybody to understand. Thank you for that. I don't see any other questions coming in. If you do have questions, please reach out. Um, to Jen and Katie um, with the emails. And so I just want to thank you again for that uh, wonderful presentation. It was a pleasure to have you with us. And I will pass it on to Edward. Thanks for having us. Thank you.